Thank you. Welcome back. I do hope that you all enjoyed your networking and the workshops. We're just about to move on to a question and answer session with our, our cross-party panel. Um, you'll have gathered by now just how important it is that we have these opportunities to get together. And a really important part of the conference is, is that connection. And I, I was previously privileged to take part in this cross-party panel. And I'm just going to, to share a little of my experience. I was taking part in the panel. I, I took a question from a, a business owner and I expressed my interest and support for, for their work in trying to expand a, an outdoor pursuits business. Fast forward a few months and I found myself being fitted with a helmet and a harness. <laughs> Next thing I'm in a Land Rover and I'm heading up a rugged hillside. A few minutes later, I find myself standing on a wooden platform with the business owner saying to me, there's the Solway Firth, there's the Isle of Man. Brief seconds later, I'm clipped to what was, at that point, Europe's longest zip wire. <laughs> and I find myself whizzing across, passing belted galloways, foliage, farms and the like. But I suppose the important part of that story is that I had an opportunity to visit that business and understand, you know, the, the challenges facing those who wish to get businesses off the ground and to see them sustained and developed. Anyway, en enough of that. Um, it's my great privilege to introduce our panellists today. We have John Swinney, MSP, Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for COVID Recovery and, as we've heard, Interim Finance and Economy Minister. We have Liz Smith, MSP, from the Conservative and Unionist Party. Daniel Johnson, MSP, from Scottish Labour. Maggie Chapman, MSP, from Scottish Greens. And, of course, my uh, <laughs> colleague with his Deputy Presiding Officer hat on at times, Liam MacArthur, MSP, today representing the Scottish Liberal Democrats. So this is now your opportunity to put questions to the panel. I want to encourage as many questions and answers as possible. And as I would often say in the course of my weekly uh, normal days, short, and con short, concise questions and responses will enable me to get more people in to this session. We'll, we'll hear from, from more of you. So please just put up your hands. Do stand if you're able. Um, if you just share your name and organisation. So who would like to, to kick off? Oh, thank you. If we can have a microphone here, please. Uh, hello, come on. <laughs> oh, oh, that one, sorry. Oh, there we go. Uh, hello, my name is Graham Galloway. Uh, I work with a charity based in Kerry Muir called Kerry Connections. Uh, we haven't really heard an awful lot about the, the impact the third sector has on the Scottish economy today so far. There are, are 45,000 charities, social enterprises, community interest companies in Scotland uh, that generate over £5 billion for the Scottish economy. Uh, and the actual impact is significantly higher than that because the social return on that money is huge on the support that charities give to uh, our statutory organisations. We're here talking about a 10-year strategy. The, the reality is for most small charities, they can't even look three years into the future because they're stuck in an endless round of short-term funding issues. So my question to the panel is, how, how do we support the third sector to look at a 10-year strategy? How do we give uh, an option for a long-term view for the third sector in Scotland? Okay. I'm probably not going to put every question to every panel member, but to get us off, to, to kick us off, if we could each address that briefly, and we'll start from this end and work to the right. Thanks, President Officer. And I think just from your, your start, you said you're from Kerry Muir, which of course is a wonderful town in Angus that I had the privilege to represent for many years, so welcome indeed. I think the, the issues on, on supporting the third sector, the third sector's got a critical role to play within our society in a whole variety of different walks of life, whether that's in the delivery of some of the essential support and services in communities that uh, are available, or alternatively, as the prov provider of commercial goods within our, uh, our economy. I had a super example last night um, from Gary Lane, who was um, from Dovetail Enterprises in Dundee, um, who uh, manufacture furniture and mattresses um, uh, as part of a, uh, a social enterprise. And it's a, a glorious example of what should happen, which is they were able to pitch for 
public procurement work from Social Security Scotland, who've got new offices in the city of Dundee, opposite the V&A, and they've won a contract there, and they're supplying that. Now, that's what should happen. I'm not going to sit here and insult you by saying that happens all the time. It doesn't happen enough, in my view. So the procurement workshop today that will have wrestled with some of these questions, I think we've got to make sure the procurement process is easier for social enterprises uh, to be uh, considered there. Secondly, I think uh, our enterprise agencies have got to be active supporters of social enterprise. Uh, you are businesses, you are not charities, so you merit as much business support as other organisations. And thirdly, in terms of um, public funding, and you know, I'm very close to these issues and I know the difficulties, ideally, where there's public funding available, it should be available on a more sustained basis. The longest it's ever going to be is going to be three years uh, in reality. Um, we don't often get that far because we perhaps don't have the line of sight about future budgets that will enable us to do that. You know, I'm putting a budget through Parliament uh, just now which has only got a one-year horizon in it because we've got such uncertainty about the public finances. So ideally, a longer line of sight would help to support uh, organisations such as your own. Thank you. Please. Uh, thank you, first of all, for your question. It's exactly the same question that was uh, asked at the recent SCDI conference, because, as John Swinney has rightly said, the work that you do is absolutely critical, not just because of the impact on the economy, but because of the excellent work that you can do from a social uh, dimension. Now, Daniel Johnson and I sit on the Finance Committee in this Parliament, and one of our concerns is exactly on the last point that John Swinney raised, is that you're not able to plan ahead for what you want to do in taking uh, decisions about the future sustainability, because you're having to live from you know, one month to the next, not really knowing what your finances are going to be. And I think there's a lesson for the Parliament in this. Um, we're trying to get greater transparency on where money goes and how effective it is um, when it's being uh, delivered on a project. Um, we would like to see budgets that have uh, more scope for a th at least a three-year period. And that's something that you know, universities and colleges would like to see, for example. So I think it's a really good question that you've asked. And I think we've got a role right here in this parliament to try to make it possible to have um, you know, a greater future for you by a better budget. William? Yeah, I, I should probably start by declaring an interest. My wife is the director of a third sector um, enterprise in, in Orkney. I, I think, um, as you've heard from John and Liz, third sector are absolutely integral, I think, in every community across the country, but that's no, no more so the case than in, in a community like uh, Orkney. I won't repeat the points that have been made in relation to funding. I think that's well understood, and I think we've made some progress, but need to make a good deal more in providing line of sight and certainty on future funding. I think in terms of the, the, the procurement point that John was referring to, I think taking it back a step, I, I think there's more that we can also do in terms of the co-design of those services, so that, in a sense, what third sector aren't doing are simply bidding in for yeah. something where yeah. the parameters have already been uh, set. I think also from a conversation I was having last night, actually there is more of a, in a, in a well-being economy, it's not surprising that we're seeing more of a blurring of the lines between social enterprises and more traditional style businesses. And I think we need to um, recognise that, reflect that. And I think in terms of the support that's provided to those um, social enterprises and businesses, the eligibility criteria and, 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 and other aspects of how you access that financial and other support probably need a refresh because in a sense that they're, they're, it, it, you're constantly having to do that, I think. But it, at, at the moment, and, and given the visions going forward, it, it seems an appropriate point to, to, to look at reflecting that better in terms of the support that the enterprise agencies and, and others are, are providing. Daniel? So uh, uh, let me two points, one broad point and one specific point about uh, funding. So in terms of the broad point, I've just been sitting in the, the tourism workshop where we're talking about the challenges of technology adoption <coughs> and actually about staying relevant, accessing customers. And all of those things are absolutely true. And it, what struck me as a former retailer it, with a complete read across for retail, but actually it's a complete read across for the third sector as well. And I think one of the things we need to recognise, these challenges facing business are actually just the challenges in terms of running an organisation, be it private sector, be it third sector, be it social enterprise, be it the public sector. So let's actually give policies that actually help all organisations embrace the challenges that are facing them in terms of workforce, productivity, technology, etc. So I think we need to make sure that all of those policies address and encompass 
third sector and social enterprises. So that's a sort of broad point. On the specific point, we absolutely have to get a minimum of three-year planning horizons. And look, I think one of the things, and I accept what John is saying about the limitations the Scottish Government have, but what I would also say, and to all the private sector organisations, as a retailer, I'd have loved to have known what my revenue was going to be next year, absolutely precisely. I never did. It didn't stop me from making plans, having a best case, an expected and a pessimistic scenario, and setting out the parameters. And I think even if, you know, beyond the planning horizon, you can't absolutely have 100% certainty, that we could have the, at least the kind of insight into the decision making that might be uh, uh, that you know, the future decisions in terms of funding will be made upon. So at least you have some insight, as opposed to essentially being a, a cliff edge and, and a, a black curtain beyond the, the, the current funding cycle. Maggie. Thanks, Graham. Thank you very much for your question. I, I think one of the really important things in your question is the, the benefit, the social, the social benefit of the work that third sector taking broadly does. And I don't think we account for that effectively in either the way in which we uh, support, as, as John says, through social enterprises uh, and, and the enterprise agencies, uh, but, but also actually in the, some of the structures and the processes that, that we have in place. I don't disagree with what Daniel said about multi-year funding. We've been talking about multi-year funding for, for over a decade and the security of that. But I think there's also something else within that. It's okay to say, yes, we have that multi-year funding, but does that multi-year funding provide full cost recovery? Does the single-year funding that we have provide full cost recovery for, for a range of charities? And the answer is no. And within that as well, Charity, so many third sector organisations, and I say this as somebody who's worked in and, and had to go through the process of, of grant applications, you know you can work for nine months of the year, and then the last three months you you starting redundancy processes for staff, you starting um, funding applications, uh, whether it's to the Scottish Government or is it, it's to other funders. And I think we have to have a look at that process. Why is it that every single year, every single third sector organisation need, needs to show the same levels of proof that they are doing what they are doing yeah. to the same funders to get the same paltry yeah. sums of money. Why can we not streamline that? Why can we not ha have a central system that says, we know that you check child protection uh, criteria. We know that you check um, vulnerable adult uh, support criteria. We don't need to uh, review that every single year. Maybe we should review it a a on, a on a less regular basis, absolutely. But I think in the process of funding applications, particularly for third sector organisations that are relying on Scottish Government or other uh, sort of lottery, lottery funding, those, those kinds of things. You don't want to be spending a quarter of your year in that, in that funding doom because that's a quarter of, of your effort wasted, you, a quarter of your time not spent delivering the services that we know delivers the social, the, the impact for, for society and, and community well-being. Okay, thank you. I'm going to take, I'll take two or three questions together. Um, I'm going to make sure I'm... I'm, I'm looking round everywhere. Can I take the, the, the lady second from the, the back row there? Thank um, you. I'll take the gentleman behind and the, at the back here too. So we'll take these three and put them to the panel. Um, thank you. Uh, we're, um, I'm from a retailer in Scotland. We have 12 stores. We've been opening our doors onto the Scottish High Street for 125 years. And we very much welcomed the um, freeze and the poundage rate and the rates. But... Sadly, again, just as we had to do through the pandemic, we are seeing businesses south of the border and also the Welsh govern Government following suit to give better relief in rates for the year ahead. Um, and we've seen December with the postal strikes, more people coming back to the high street, which is better for our economy. Um, and it seems that really for us to get that support in rates, does it protect the rate? income that we give put back into the Scottish economy. I mean, our income is £265,000 a year in rates, and I think a bit of help this year would certainly be welcomed. Um, and I think this week, even more important, as you see, the loss of m &Co, which we're pretty much trading in every high street in Scotland, near enough. Um, and that's now been bought by an English retailer, which is more than likely going to close most of that footprint. Um, so, thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. I've got the back here. Uh, Bill Ireland from Logan Energy. Um, we deal with renewable energy and, and uh, hydrogen. Um, I, I find the, the, the comment about um, looking one year ahead 
quite bizarre. We don't plan hospitals, roads, power stations, wind farms on a year-by-year -year basis. You look at the total cost of ownership, and I think that is um, a major problem with our political system, uh, is that we don't actually look at long-term uh, investment uh, that we can put forward. I mean, we, we are doing this on a build and operate basis, that we are going to be generating renewable energy for the next 20, 25 years, um, and producing hydrogen for transport, for heating. Uh, we're working with our Becky Distillery to decarbonise their whisky products and, and gin and vodka. Um, all of that is long term. That's not a year by year basis. That's a 20 year plan. So I think there needs to be a change in that attitude to invest in Scotland, Scotland businesses, Scotland infrastructure. And that's, I think, what's happening in, the, uh, in Scotwind is that's not looking at next year, that's actually looking at the next 50 years. Okay, thank, thank you. And I'll take the, the question at the back here, too. Thank you. Um, uh, Ed Nimmons from Carbon Capture Scotland. We capture CO2 in Scotland. Um, a little bit related to uh, Bill's question, actually. We have a, we're developing a process to, that will remove a million tonnes of CO2 from the atmosphere per year uh, before 2030. And uh, I was just wondering what the panel thinks uh, are good ways to uh, incentivise decarbonisation or indeed carbon removal uh, in the short and medium term. OK, thank you. I'm going to put those questions in the first instance to Liz. Well, can I just pick up the point uh, from the lady about uh, business uh, rates and the relief that uh, your colleagues down south uh, have had? Um, I'm sure Mr Swinney will be asking me uh, fairly shortly to have a little bit of engagement before stage uh, three of the budget. And one of the things I would like to um, put to him is that through the Barnet consequentials, uh, there should be some money uh, available to help with that. Because I think you're absolutely right. Uh, when we look particularly at leisure, at uh, retail, hospitality, you know, critical, really critical areas of the uh, economy, um, I think you're making a very good case uh, on, on that basis. On the questions of um, uh, planning ahead, I think one, one of the tensions at the moment, uh, whether it's budget down south or the budget here, is that some of the infrastructure projects that we would all like to see are hugely expensive. And they are putting real you know, tensions within uh, the budget planning um, because you know, some, of, some of these uh, infrastructure projects are desperately needed, um, but they, they wouldn't be developed over a period of a year or even three years. Some of them will be 10, 20 years, just as you've uh, rightly uh, set out and I think we need to think very carefully about the planning that we have for infrastructure projects and one of the things in this parliament um, is the fact that there is a national performance framework and an another issue that's come up at the finance committee is how well are we spending the money um, that we are you know delivering on uh, key projects and I think there's a, there's a good case to be put about measuring the value of what we're doing so I totally accept the point that you've made. And, and also in relation to the uh, medium term planning, I, I think that's part of the same uh, issue. Uh, we need to decide, you know, budgets are make, about making choices, very difficult choices, particularly just now. And I think we need to, to decide where is the best value, um, particularly as we're trying to strive towards net zero. Um, that is a big tension at the moment about how we, and I know this is something that local government feeds back to us just now, there's a lot of tension about it. They're desperate to uh, ensure that they are greener with net zero at the top of the agenda. But they're getting uh, into difficulty with how quickly that can happen. So I, I think that's a real problem, actually, I'll be quite honest. I think that's a very difficult uh, issue, and I think that comes back to the heart of some of the budget issues that we're grappling with just now. I'll put this to the Deputy First Minister and then to Maggie. Can I, um, can I take the, the, really the two topic areas? First of all, in rates relief, you know, there's, there's, Liz is correct. These, these are integral decisions in the budget process that we are involved in. And um, you know, I've been very open with Parliament that we face enormous pressures in that, in, in that budget process. I haven't been able to put into the budget all the commitments that people would want me to put in simply because... Uh, of the limitations of finance and the corrosive effect of inflation. So you know, we really do need to see a, an economic strategy that reduces inflation because it will be 
um, a corrosive weakening of so much of the investment in our economy if we don't uh, succeed in that. On rates relief, I, 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 I have responded as well as I can uh, to date um, to the calls from business organisations to freeze business rates, and you know, that, that comes at a cost to the public purse of about £308 million. Pounds. And the total package of support, and a lot of retail businesses will be touched by the reliefs that we have in place through the Small Business Bonus Scheme, for example. And we estimate about half of retail um, and hospitality businesses will um, essentially be exempt from business rates by the nature of that. I do accept, however, there will be stores like the Wilkie stores that have got a larger footprint that will make them uh, pay business rates. Um, but it's, it's an issue that, you know, that, 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 that's essentially the conclusion that I've been able to get to so far with the resources that, I'm avail that are available to me. But as Liz Smith says, we have further stages of the parliamentary process to go through. On the two points that the two gentlemen raised, one on carbon capture, one on renewable energy. I think the answer to this, I, I'd like to reassure gentlemen at the back here that we're, we're not just looking at things 12 months ahead. Um, that might be in, in, in kind of immediate budget issues. But if you look at, there's an important point about policy certainty, because if you look at the question of policy certainty on renewable energy, we gave policy certainty 15 years ago that our government would be committed to the decarbonisation of electricity. There was no wavering, there was no equivocation, there was no humming and hawing. We were decarbonising electricity. So we gave that policy certainty. What then happened was that other people in the private sector, mostly the power companies and investors, looked at the policy certainty we gave and invested in renewable electricity to the point where Scotland has largely decarbonised our electricity networks in about 15 years. Why was that? It was be not because the government put loads of money in. The government gave policy certainty, which wasn't going to waver, and private companies were then able to invest. And thank goodness we did that. And that essentially is where I come to carbon capture. It needs policy certainty as well, that it's a tool that we're going to stick with for the long term so that investors can get behind the, the project at the back that I was hearing about last night, which is fascinating, um, and recognise that we can help to uh, ca uh, uh, capture carbon um, in, in different ways, different forms, uh, to ensure that we realise that potential. But it needs crucial, it doesn't always need money from the government, but it does need policy certainty and direction. And certainly on the question of carbon capture, I think it's pretty clear where this government is coming from. And if you can offer that policy certainty, I think it helps. So it's Maggie. not just all about one-year budgets, it's about policy certainty too. Thank you. And Maggie? And th th thanks for, for those questions. I think on, on the rates, I won't, I won't repeat what Liz and, and John have said, but I, I do think one of the things that we need to do seriously in Scotland over the coming years is actually think about what we mean when, when we're talking about taxation around property, around land, around, around those kinds of things for, for businesses as, as well as, as for, for um, uh, uh, citizens. I don't think we, we've started those conversations early enough, and I appreciate that that's not going to support us now. It's not going to support you in your businesses from April, but I think we do have the next few weeks to engage in, in, in the budget process, as, as John and, and Liz have, have outlined. But we mustn't lose sight, I think, of the need for, for quite radical reform in, in how taxation works. Um, on, on the planning and investment questions, I think there's, we're in the mess we're in. In a, in a whole range of, of different situations, whether that's the climate emergency, whether that's our, our economic situation, because we've failed to plan over decades. We've failed to, to do the, the necessary long-term planning and have the policy consistency alongside that that, that John has, has talked about. I think there, there are, are attempts, you know, we are starting to do that better than, than, than we, we've, we've done before. And I think there, there's, there's still quite a lot of education uh, for us as politicians, for, for business communities and, and, and for others to, to, to come into and thinking, what does this actually look like? Because one of the challenges, I think, is in times of economic hardship, the, the, 
the, the sort of almost a knee-jerk reaction is to close ranks, is to look, look inward. And actually, where we see some of the more radical approaches to dealing with economic uncertainty is it's bringing more people in. It's, it's, it's looking out to people. And we are, we are starting to do that. Um, but I think we can learn much more, effect, much more effective ways of doing, doing some of that if we look to, to other parts of the world. I'm thinking particularly around some of the really quite groundbreaking and now normal approaches to, to budgeting and planning that they do in Latin America. On the, on the investment point, I think we, we may dis disagree on the specifics around, around that industry, but it's not only um, policy certainty. I think that there's something else to look at the, the wider environment is why would people come in terms of the skills, in terms of the expertise, why would people choose to come to Scotland to support those kinds of industries and those kinds of endeavours? And we, we don't always make those kinds of connections. There may be money available or never enough, but there may be some targeted investment that is needed, but it's actually the, the bigger picture because treating these kinds of things in isolation, in a vacuum, I think misses, misses the wider benefits that we could, we could have for, for society as a whole. Okay, thank you. Going to take some more questions. Please do put up your hands. Going to go here in the first instance and then there. But was there another hand there? No? Okay. So I've got one there, one there. Okay, let, let's, let's take these two questions together. Hi, I'm Louise McQuaid from Young Enterprise Scotland. Um, I just want to touch on what we talked about this morning about upskilling and reskilling and looking at that from a rural perspective. Um, so I think living in a remote and rural area, what happens in communities is that we find a way of just getting by because that's what we have to do. And there is that mentality, well, that's just what we do. And so therefore there's no value in themselves and their skills and their industry. Um, and what I was wondering was what actions are you taking at policy level to go from a bottom-up approach rather than a top-down approach in one, seeing that these industries, particularly agriculture and agriculture in Orkney, the value that they have in themselves and the wider community and how we can use that in education. So we want to upskill and there is a, a vast range of skill set, but they don't see that value in themselves. So how can we embed that and bring that into policy and using rurality and the remote skills that we use on a daily basis, living in remote areas to more central belt, because there's a massive skill set there and they do have that attitude. That's just what we do. But can we use those skills and how are you going to work that into policy, if at all, to utilise those skills and bring it to other industries from the rural context? Okay. Thank you. And over here. Thank you. Um, my name is Kirsty Thompson. I'm the founder and chief exec of The Circle, which is based in Dundee in Glasgow. And I'm a social entrepreneur, first and foremost. I'm also a WES ambassador. And I would just like to talk to you about the structuring that we've set up. We actually operate three premises across Scotland. Right now, that's over 50,000 square foot of premises that we're operating. We support charities and social enterprises in terms of affordable accommodation. We offer a consultancy support to um, charities and social enterprises, and we also offer an HNC level qualification to those going through that training. Our purpose is very clear. We are a living wage provider. We adopt fair working practices. We um, are also a four day working week provider. We, by our very nature, are focused on the people in our or organisations as, as assets. And we invest in their mental health and well-being right now through um, support through psychologists. So I don't think there's any denial on the purpose of what we're there to do. However, right now, my organisation employs 20 people. We're responsible for 31 other charities and social enterprises through the buildings that we run. And right now, the cost that we are covering is a 400% increase in our energy costs. And we need to pay our wage bill every month. What is the government going to do to support that? Okay, I'm going to put that one in the first instance to Daniel and then Liam. Um, 
Apologies, presiding officer, but I can't hear business rates being mentioned and not say something about it. Having, and I speak, and this is it's a topic where I struggle to remain a politician and not revert back to being a shopkeeper that saw one of my units go from having an RV of £11,000 to £45,000 and having to go through that whole uh, journey of, of appealing. Now, that has changed a little bit, but the fundamental point I would make is this, is it is a levy that government doesn't want to touch because it's nice and consistent, but that actually almost demonstrates why it doesn't work, because it doesn't reflect the context that businesses face. And I think that a, 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 a levy such as that, which actually has to be adjusted so much and altered so much on a time-to-time -time basis, actually shows you that it's a dysfunctional levy. So I actually think we need more, more fundamental reform of, of that level of taxation. Businesses should be contributing to local services, but we need one that actually reflects a business context and one that doesn't actually inhibit their investment, which many sectors, uh, business rates does. Um, look, on Young Enterprise Scotland and upskilling, I think fundamentally what you're talking about is so important. You know, people are a finite resource. We, we are entering a situation where the workforce is shrinking, and that's not just in Scotland, that's globally. By the end of this century, the global population will be falling. So therefore, we need to ensure that upskilling is something that we are doing from the, you know, people, you know, the beginning, but right the way people's working careers. Um, so I think we need to be thinking about the successes we've had in skills, but building on that, making that, that sure that, that we continue to have absolutely solid, credible uh, qualifications, but that, that we ask ourselves, well, what's stopping people accessing them? What, what, what's preventing people getting them? And actually, we need to also show young people the pathways. That there's a huge amount in that, and I'm covering it incredibly briefly, but I think this is actually one of the really urgent topics of our time. Upskilling, reskilling is what we need to get much, much better at if we're going to have a smaller workforce. And then just finally, look, April is a horrific uh, cliff edge. Uh, you know, 400% is not the worst uh, multiplier I've heard in terms of the increase in utilities bills that organisations are facing. And, and I don't think there are any simple answers, but I think one of the fundamental things that we really need to do, because not all of this is within the, 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 the auspices of the Scottish Government, is we need a really urgent action to try and get ourselves off gas, whether that's commercial premises, domestic premises. Is that quick? No. But the sooner we, 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 we accelerate that action, the, 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 the sooner we'll see the, the benefits of it. Now, again, that's a huge topic and a very brief answer. But I, think, I, I don't think there's enough cognizance of what a cliff edge April is bringing for, for, for businesses. I, I, there's one local business that showed me that their, their, their renewal quote is going to show that their utilities are going to go from a five-figure sum to a six-figure sum. And, and that's being faced by a lot of organisations, private, voluntary, third sector, or what have you. Thank you. Liam? I think John earlier on um, said how delighted he was to see Graham, a former constituent here in the, the chamber. Can I say how ecstatic I am to have one of my own constituents uh, here and asking uh, a question that happens a good deal uh, more rarely than it does for, <laughs> I think, probably anybody else on the panel. Uh, I think the, I, I would echo what um, Daniel said in, in relation to the importance of that, 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 that point about upskilling and reskilling. And I think the point you make about um, the particular dynamics in a rural and island community, I mean, Orkney has been fortunate to have relatively low unemployment um, over recent decades, but, but high levels of underemployment and certainly low wage. And I think uh, some of that stems from, from the undervaluing of the skills uh, that are there. We, we rely very heavily on, um, on, on volunteering, for, for, for example, for, for the, the contribution that the, the third sector, etc., and charities make uh, within that community. And, and that's fantastic, but I think to some extent has contributed to that undervaluing of, of, of those skills. I think the only cautionary note I would, I would lodge is that um, for very good and sensible reasons that the government in, in, in the previous session brought forward requirements for home care workers, for example, to go through training that would allow the accreditation of the skills that they had. And for many in the Isles, and, and obviously Louise, you're out in one of the North Isles, um, though not quite as North as the one I was brought up on. Um, but that led to those in the home care sector in a lot of those aisles saying, you know what, I'm going to step back from this because I can't afford the time to come into Kirkwall to go to Orkney College to do the courses. So 
I agree we need to find ways of upskilling and reskilling, but let's make sure we do it in a way that doesn't actually make the problems, it, it, particularly in highly press, <coughs> pressurised services or, or, or businesses, even worse in the way that we do it. Uh, Kirsty, you and I had, a, um, I had an opportunity to chat last night. The, the, the enterprise that uh, you're engaged in in Dundee and Glasgow and hopefully further afield in due course it is a wonderful example of, of, of what can be done um, to, 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 to regenerate uh, within communities, to, 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 to give back, etc. And part of what I was saying earlier about blurring those lines between social enterprise and more traditional businesses, I think it's reflected in what you do. I think Daniel's right in terms of um, the, the, the urgent need to, 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 to decouple um, our electricity prices from, 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 from gas, uh, I think, is exemplified by what you say. The other example you were using last night was because of the, the model you're operating. You have a dozen, 17, 18 metres within those premises, and therefore you're, you're dealing with additional standing charges, etc., etc. So I, I think there need to be creative ways about dealing with those specific aspects, but I think more broadly we, we need to get to a situation where our electricity, particularly as we're decarbonising energy generation as a whole, we need to, to, to find a way to decouple from, uh, from, from gas prices, because I think uh, that is the only sustainable way that businesses like yourself, but across the field, uh, are going to be able to survive. I think as there was a request for a response from government, I'm going to bring in the Deputy First Minister here. Thank, thanks very much, um, Presiding Officer. Uh, just on one, one comment to add on the, on this, the skills point that I think there is, and I think it addresses the point that Liam is raising, although he will then follow up by saying to me, yeah, but only if the broadband is good enough. Um, and that is about digital learning opportunities, which um, I, I think there's a lot of very good examples. Um, I, the, 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 network, the two colleges in the south of Scotland in um, Borders and De Vries and Galloway have launched a, a hub and spoke model which allows the distribution through digital technology of learning to a vast array of village halls, the length and breadth of the borders. Uh, it does depend upon broadband, so I do. I, I know it's a challenge, so Liam. And some, point before me, well, I know I, well, exactly, but I, I have heard you talking about these issues before. But I think it is part of the answer to the point that you raise. Um, on Kirsten's point, uh, I think the. I, I think we, we. I think we all probably agree that the energy market is failing completely. It's absurd what is going on just now. Totally absurd, and the danger is that organisations like your own and many other organisations who are of themselves perfectly sustainable operations, but they cannot possibly deal with changes in energy costs of the magnitude you're talking about. It's just preposterous. So the energy market needs to be fixed. So I completely agree with my colleagues about the, the reform that's required there. In the short term, however, you face challenges uh, in April. And I think the answer to that um, has to be a revisiting of the windfall taxes on energy companies. The profits that were made yesterday, announced yesterday by Shell are just ludicrous, totally absurd. So, you know, I, the, and, and I, we are making these points to the United Kingdom government, who have the power here, that we, we, you know, that has to be remedied, because it's not, the market's not supposed to work like that. It's not supposed to generate those absurd conclusions. So. On the one hand, you've got Shell making exorbitant profits. On the other, you and countless other people here are absolutely going to be facing tough times. Now, I had a constituent came to see me, a very, very successful uh, uh, businessman. Um, uh, I doubt um, he will ever be a supporter of mine politically. Very different political views on the world. And he said to me, um, there's a massive wealth redistribution exercise going on here. And it's completely and utterly dysfunctional because it's wealth distribution from loads and loads of people here in the businesses you're operating to a very small cohort of shareholder groups in the energy companies. So that needs to be remedied because the, 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 the gain that's been made is, is, is so in the long term, energy market reform, in the short term, the windfall tax needs to be revisited. And I'll just be completely candid about our public finances. I was rehearsing these issues with Daniel Johnson just yesterday. The government, the Scottish government's budget, you know, I, I, I've fully allocated all that we've got. The idea of, for me to have a credible energy reduction price package for you would take, I don't know, probably, you know, probably one and a half, two billion pounds. I just, it's just beyond us. 
So it needs that intervention as a windfall tax in the short term, which we're pressing the UK Government to consider. Thank you. So I'm going to take further questions. Um, we'll go here in the first instance. Are there any others? And then, then to yourself. If we take these two questions. Hello, uh, my name is Kirsten Stewart. I'm a designer and entrepreneur from Orkney. Um, I've got two questions. Uh, firstly, I heard uh, lots of encouragement for new businesses, new entrepreneurs in Scotland, but um, thinking about Kirsty and what we've been talking about um, across the, today and last night, how are you supporting the existing um, entrepreneurs that are, are battle-scarred battle and a bit, um, have been disabled by the storm of the last few years? And also with my design designer hat on. I heard Nicola mention design and that makes me think about design thinking and how are you using design thinking in Parliament. Thank you. And here. Thank you. Um, my name is Sarah Downs. I am an SME business owner based in Aberdeen but I'm also the IOD chair of the Aberdeen and Grampian branch. Um, I sat in a CBI dinner um, with the Deputy First Minister not that long ago, where you shared a stage with Keith Anderson, CEO of Scottish Power, and Simon Roddy, Vice President of Shell UK Upstream. And there was a fascinating conversation um, that, that evening around the table around the transition. And you've already mentioned um, the windfall tax and the decisions that government are making there. But what I want to bring, and this is really from you know, my local IOD members who are huge percentage supporting the oil and gas industry and renewable energy industry and the transition, is as, these hits, as this hits at operator level, there is obviously a knock-on effect into this supply chain. And that supply chain are also having to pay more for their energy bills, more for their business rates and all the other, you know, um, changes that are happening for all businesses across the country. But on top of that, their main buyers are going to put projects on hold. They're going to start investing in other regions of the world. And you know, the, the profits that are being reported are global profits, not obviously UK profits, to bear that in mind. So my question to, to government is, what are you going to do to support the supply chain that are invested in their transition? Almost all of them are already in diversification strategy stage, if not already implementation, which have been since about 2015. But they are being hit doubly hard when these decisions are being made. And I'm, I'm not saying the decision's right or wrong, but what are you going to do to support that supply chain, please? OK, thank you. I'm going to, before I pass over, just ask um, my colleagues to be as concise as possible. I'm going to go to Liz first and then Maggie. Uh, firstly, on entrepreneurship, um, that is absolutely critical. Um, in fact, I'll have the privilege of uh, chairing a reception uh, next week in this parliament about young entrepreneurs. And it's, it's a combination of ensuring that young people uh, are inspired. And I, some young enterprise people I was speaking to uh, last night, um, I think they do a wonderful job in inculcating that ambition to be an entrepreneur and to look at the challenges that you face with that. O entrepreneurs only thrive when they have the right environment uh, around them and that's partly in education and I think you know John Swinney and I were in the education brief for quite a long time in this parliament and an awful lot of the dialogue that we had at that time was what we have to do to ensure that the uh, curriculum uh, in Scotland matches up with the aspirations of young people we could spend uh, the rest of today talking about that but I think it, it is we've got to free up the spirit of entrepreneurs and make sure that um, they, they feel uh, particularly welcome in Scotland, that the right policies, whether that's in housing uh, or in um, a lot of things to do with social enterprise as well, but uh, in tax policy, uh, in education and just a whole lot of things to do with uh, communities that they feel inspired. So I think you're absolutely right about what entrepreneurship is all about. On the question um, when it comes to the transition, I think this is one of the, going back to my uh, first answer, I, I think there's a real tension here about uh, transition. We all want to see that transition being very effective. We know it is the right thing to do, but we also know that oil and gas is critically important to uh, the Scottish economy, not least because of the uh, number of you know, 
highly paid and very skilled jobs uh, in the northeast of Scotland. So I think we've got a lot of thinking to do uh, to ensure that that transition um, works effectively. And to answer your question about the supply chains, I think there's a lot of global issues to do with supply chains just now. I don't think this is just a Scottish-UK issue, um, but it, I, I think that's a, an important point that you've raised. Thank you. Maggie? Th thanks. I, I think j just on, on the question around uh, entrepreneurialism, I think you, you, you live in Orkney, and we've already heard some of the, the comments around how rural businesses, rural entrepreneurs have to be innovative, have to be creative, and, and are by, by your, your, your very, very nature. And I think one, one of the things that we need to ensure we've got right, um, especially for the, the, the storm-weary uh, folk that have been through the last, uh, last few years, is ensuring that we have the right sec sectoral and regional uh, focus. Um, and, what, what, what will work in the central belt will not be the same as what will work in, in Orkney or, or in the rural parts of the North East or, or, or wherever. And I'm not always sure that our regional economic planning uh, allows us to get tho those things right. As part of the National Strategy for Economic Transformation, that we will see regional economic plans being developed with, with, with much more um, agility, I hope, around what is, what is needed for, for people where they are, rather than trying to import um, a solution from a, a geography or a sector that, that doesn't work. So, so I, I, I think there's, there's this need for, for that kind of targeted support. But to, to your point around design, think, you know, bringing design thinking and designing our, our economy we know that the economy we, we've got at the moment does not work for, for many, many people. So let's bring people in and talk about what the economy is for, how, how we can develop the kind of economy that we know will sustain local communities, be part of regional supply chains, be part of national and, and international um, trade and, 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 and other relationships. I don't think we've got... It, it, it will, it's quite a brave thing to do to say, actually, let's not start from scratch because we're not starting from scratch, but let's actually not replicate the mistakes that we've been making, certainly for the last 20, 30 years in, 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 the, in, in those kinds of, of environments. On um, supply chains and, and uh, um, the, that, the transition, I think you mentioned that the tension between seeing the global profits that we've had announced this week, viewing those as they, they are global rather than, than UK based. And I think Liz, Liz pointed to the, the Scottish versus global supply chain tension. I think, I think we, do, we do have a, a knotty issue there, there to make sure that, that we, we, we tackle. But I think part of the issue is making sure that we have... We, we don't just think about transitioning the supply chains that we currently have. We think, actually, what, what are the new, what are the different supply chains that we need? Why, why can we not support and... and uh, focus investment to regenerate manufacturing and industry in Scotland so we aren't as reliant and we aren't as vulnerable to global shocks in, in, in the way that we've seen, whether it's a, a boat getting stuck in the Suez Canal, for instance. You know, we, we need to build our resilience and that kind of resilience starts here. It doesn't, it, we, we do need to take that focused look at what the Scottish economy can do for Scottish supply chains and, and Scottish manufacturing and I think that, that's, that's a really, really important thing for us to focus on. And Liam? Thank you. <coughs> I'm beginning to think that um, Orkney constituents are like <laughs> London buses. It's, uh, <laughs> but long may this continue. Um, I, I think in terms of the point about entrepreneurship um, that, that Christine raised, um, I, I'd appreciate it's more difficult um, because in the sense you're dealing with so many different um, uh, entrepreneurs and, and, and businesses in different sectors that they're, they're in. Um, but that's not a reason to not find ways of providing the support they, they need. And some of that, I think, needs to be um, through agencies such as the enterprise agencies. Um, but, but actually, oftentimes, it will be trying to find ways of facilitating the peer-to-peer -peer support because actually the support they need isn't from government I'm here to help it's actually probably either within their own sector or across sectors and providing the forums and the mechanisms of facilitating those sorts of conversations um, is, is, is probably the best thing that, that um, government and its agencies uh, can do I think in terms of that point about building design into policy making 
Um, I think I was in the, uh, in the breakout group um, dealing with um, uh, the development of strategies, and we were being encouraged to be creative. That's actually what you need to do. You can always discount the idea, but unless you've stress tested it, you've at least considered it, then you're going to be stuck in doing the same old same old, albeit maybe a little bit better, and you can do it digitally. Um, so I think as, as policy makers, we need to be able to expose ourselves to those ideas in terms of the policy making. It will take us out of the comfort zone. But unless you're thinking about those ideas, you're not thinking creatively, then in a sense you're, only, you're going to be applying probably yesterday or today's solutions to, to tomorrow's. Uh, problems. I, I think in terms of the, 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 the transition, I, I, look, we talk about a just transition the, the whole time. I'm not sure necessarily we've got our, our hands around what exactly that means. Um, in, in somewhere like Orkney, I see this exemplified as a, a community that's been heavily reliant on, on, on oil and gas and the energy sector, but at the moment uh, is, is, is swept up in the, 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 the implications of the Scotland round. There's talk of transitioning the, uh, the, the terminal in Flotta to, to, to a green hydrogen uh, terminal in due course, almost exemplifying what, what we're talking about in terms of the, the, the just transition. I would probably disagree with Maggie in, in, in so far as Yes, there will be other supply chains that we need to develop, but if we are if we're to be honest to our commitment to a just transition, we do need to consider, for those who want to come along the journey and transition into this, um, the, the, this new sector, we need to be able to, back to Lizzie's point, upskilling, reskilling, providing the support yeah. that allow them to, to transition. And, and um, I, again, something that came up in our breakout group was that a strategy without funding is fantasy, and I think we need to recognise this is going to cost. That transition is going to, yeah. to, to, to cost. And I suppose the, the final comment I would offer is that there is no lack of ambition in terms of the targets we have set. There are ones, as, as John says, they have got policy certainty, not just because the, the, the current government set that objective, but it has been one that was set previously by the, the Labour Lib Dem coalition. It is one across, uh, across parties which has yeah. um, buy-in, and I think that gives confidence there is not going to be any handbrake turns along the way. But what the UK Climate Change Committee um, have, have repeatedly said over the last couple of years is that the, the ambition is great, but there is a lack of clarity around the action plan that will take us through to the point of, of delivery. And, and I think that is something we are all invested in because the Parliament as a whole set those, those targets. Um, uh, but we need to be challenging government to, 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 to come forward with that um, pathway to, to achieving those targets. Okay. Um, regrettably, we have actually gone beyond the time allotted for this particular session, so I am going to, to have to, to call a halt here. Um, but I would just like to ask you to thank the panellists who have joined us today and to ask them to, to retake their seats. Thank you very much. Thank you, too, for your excellent questions. I would now like to invite John Swinney, MSP, Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for COVID Recovery, to make his closing remarks. Deputy First Minister. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And um, I'll, uh, given the time, I'll keep my remarks uh, as brief as I possibly can do. First of all, can I say that uh, you set a good example by indicating the, the dangerous practice of agreeing to things that you're asked to do at uh, a, a panel like this uh, in a parliamentary session. Uh, so I'm afraid the temptation of a zip wire across the Solway Firth doesn't do much for me. I'm afraid, however wonderful the Galloway landscape is, it wouldn't do much for me. But I did agree to wear the Young Enterprise Scotland tie, and I managed to tie it myself <laughs> using using one of the glass panes along there as my cover. So it just demonstrates that I can tie my own tie after all these years. Uh, so thank you to Young Enterprise Scotland for uh, giving that to me just at the start. Um, can I just say a couple of things about the last question round that I didn't get a chance to, to say about to, to Christine about um, support for existing entrepreneurs. Uh, in our uh, national strategy on economic transformation, there is a huge emphasis, as the First Minister talked this morning, about uh, encouraging an entrepreneurial culture, 
and encour encouraging entrepreneurial people. So we've got to make that happen on the ground. So our enterprise agencies are critical to that. Business Gateway is uh, critical to that. But you will probably be familiar with other organisations. Um, I, I have a huge amount of experience of a local organisation in my community called GrowBiz, which has helped to in inculcate a, an entrepreneurial culture. And, um, and obviously, we want to make sure that these uh, interventions assist people in a lot of that peer-to-peer -peer discussion, which I recognise to be critical. And you asked about design thinking. One of the best things the Scottish Government did, and I had absolutely nothing to do with this, um, was appoint a chief design officer. And the chief design officer is influential on so many of the discussions that we have. Our design of our child poverty strategy was hugely influenced by the chief design officer. The approach to employability, again, chief design officer was instrumental in busting some of the myths that we had about the way in which we had to tackle employability. So the scope of design thinking is critical in how we design public services. And to the point on the, the transition, um, I think the, the, there's, there's two observations I would make on all of this. The first is that we are going through an absolutely perfect storm just now. So lots of organisations in lots of sectors will be affected by that. So we have to, so that the, the systemic issue of energy costs and supply pressures that, 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 that come from that have to be addressed, hence my comments about windfall taxes. But secondly, we've also got to properly and fully support the, um, the transition and put the resources in place to enable that to happen. And because of the, you know, there's a number of interventions both the Scottish Government and the United Kingdom Government are making specifically in the northeast of Scotland to try to help that transition. And um, there are various other measures, such as some of the strategic developments of carbon capture, which can assist in establishing a bridge from where we are today to where we need to get to. And the crucial point I want to say is to reflect that we've got to make this experience completely different to the experience of deindustrialisation in Scotland in the 1980s, for which we are carrying enormous social and economic damage still in our country. And we have to get that, uh, we have to get that right in how we manage that transition. Um, can I uh, draw the day to a close? Uh, first of all, on behalf of the Scottish Government, thanking all of you for participating in this uh, day of discussion and also thank the parliamentary staff and the government staff who've worked together to enable all the practicalities to be overcome. I hope you agree that the forum and the format of today and last night's event give us the opportunity to uh, engage in that sustained dialogue which I know that my parliamentary colleagues of all political persuasions are involved in, in their communities on a regular basis. Um, there will not be a week goes by where members of parliament are not engaged with businesses, either addressing um, problems that businesses are facing, such as the energy cost issue we've talked about today, or actually finding out something new. And parliament's only as good as the extent to which members of parliament are actually listening and out there and engaging. And I know from what comes into me and my mailbag as a constituency member of parliament, but also what comes into me as a minister from members of parliament and others, uh, are reflections on that engagement that happens on an ongoing basis. So I think Andy Murphy's point this morning that the business dialogue must be on at all times is a critical point that we all must remember, and, and I, I take that very much to heart. There's been a couple of um, what I would call um, bumpy issues that have been raised, whether it's energy prices or deposit return scheme or short-term lights, which are challenges for different parts of business. And I assure you from the government's perspective that we are constantly engaged on these issues to try to address the points that are raised with us. And, uh, that, and, and, and I commit the government to the earliest possible engagement on all of these questions to ensure that we, we, we get uh, those correct. There's also been a strong theme today um, on the emphasis on female entrepreneurship. And uh, I would have to say in the course of my parliamentary exchanges, I appear in front of quite a number of parliamentary committees on the, given the breadth of responsibilities that I currently carry, um, uh, thankfully only for a temporary basis. Um, but the issue of female entrepreneurship and the encouragement of female entrepreneurship 
is an issue that is very much on the agenda of Members of Parliament, and the Government recognises the importance of us responding seriously to the Anna Stewart review, which we expect to receive shortly, uh, to enable us to uh, make the greatest impact we can in encouraging more women to become involved in entrepreneurship in the fashion that the First Minister talked about earlier on today. There has also been a recurring theme today around the question of skills and the availability of skills and the availability of people. And we find ourselves in really quite an unusual position just now as a country, where we have very, very low levels of unemployment, unemployment sits just over 3%, very high levels of employment, employment sits over 76%. And we're actually, so we've got an incredibly tight labour market, and we're actually seeing an annual, we saw a decline in the last 12 months of almost one percentage point in economic inactivity within Scotland. Now that's a you may say to me, well, 1%, come on, get a move on, do more than that. Actually, 1% with, in, in a, a group who face the greatest of challenges of access to the labour market is really quite a formidable achievement. Now, we're trying to intensify our activity. The work of the Chief Design Officer in designing our employability schemes are designed to get in amongst that grouping as effective as we can to support people into employment. But we have to maximise the opportunities to engage people in economic activity and to support them in so doing. So I, I, I would want to reassure uh, you all today of the importance we attach to making sure that we expand the labour market. You heard what the First Minister said this morning about migration. It's a real, you know, it, migration was helping Scotland um, for the best part of the last 20 years after the EU expansion in 2004. It's helped us for uh, the best part of one, just short of 20 years. It's the loss of that is inhibiting us now. So we've got to maximise levels of economic activity, which is why we are so focused on this point. We also need to make sure that our college and university system is responsive to the needs of the labour market in the future, not the needs of the labour market yesterday. And that's an ongoing challenge. I had a really invigorating uh, example from um, one part of the country where um, an entrepreneur was telling me they wanted to set up a new business. The skills didn't exist in the local economy. They went and knocked the door of their local college, and the local college put on a specific focused course to create the skills they required. They couldn't have been happier with the whole arrangement. Um, I, I was delighted with that, but I'm not for a moment going to say that's going to be the norm in every part of the country. We need to make it the norm to address the issues that have been raised today. So can I thank everybody for your, your participation today, for the, the open way in which you've communicated with us today. I hope uh, that you take from my comments a willingness to absorb, to, to, to listen, to understand where we are not getting it right and where we can remedy that and address these challenges and commit to working with the business community in Scotland in uh, an ongoing dialogue to make sure we can realise your ambitions and the ambitions we all have for our country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy First Minister. Um, on behalf of the Parliament, I would like to thank everyone for attending and for, for participating in today's discussions, because I know that you are all very busy people indeed. I would like to thank the Parliamentary Committee on Fair Work, the Parliament's team who have helped put on today's event, because I know from feedback from colleagues that it is incredibly important to all MSPs that we hear directly from you, and we are very, very appreciative of the time and your participation in making the conference such a success. There will be notes produced of the workshops and they will be distributed as quickly as possible. We will also reach out and ask for your feedback and we would be very appreciative if you could give us that because then we can ensure that this continues to be the, the success it is and as useful as it possibly can be. Um, very much hope to wish you to welcome you back into Parliament in the near future. For the time being, we will conclude and lunch will be served in the garden lobby and I hope you'll have a, an opportunity to carry on chatting and getting to know one better. To get, to, get one, to get to know one another better there and to continue to have the discussions that we've been enjoying since yesterday evening. But in the meantime, I close this meeting of business in the Parliament.